All right. Um, musical notes. If you only know Warren Zevon because of Werewolves of London, you should listen to some of his. He does a it's a folk pop rock from the seventies. It's very good. Um, beyond, it's it's all fairly dark. Um, does a um, a uh, ironic song about uh, about his people excusing behavior of a of a serial killer by saying he's just an excitable boy. So, and then if you don't know the Cramps, listen to the Cramps. They're Northern California band. They're royalty from the eighties. They're from Sacramento. Any rules? Uh, let's. So we, we did practice with acid base reaction last week. And I think we all got to a point where we, even if we have to continuously work our way through those steps, we got, I think, fairly comfortable with those. So there'll be a question on that on the quiz this weekend. So it's similar to, um, so the practice problems or the problems from, uh, from the, uh, lab report. Um, and then what we're going to talk about today is we're going to start getting into naming compounds and simple hydrocarbons. Um, and when I say, did I hit record? I did. Okay. Panic for a second. Um, and we say simple hydrocarbons, we basically mean we're limiting ourselves to the word hydrocarbon means just hydrogen and carbon. And simple hydrocarbons in particular, we're talking about alkanes. We're not talking about benzene rings. We're not talking about alkynes or alkenes. It's just alkanes is the only functional group, maybe with a halogen on it. Um, so, and even, even knowing that simple is a bit of a, a misnomer because it can be rather complicated looking molecules. But what we mean in OCHEM when we say simple hydrocarbons is just alkanes, even if the alkanes themselves look complex. So anything that's got acid in the name is not going to be a simple. So because it's a it's a carboxylic acid, it is part of it. You could look at it as being a simple hydrocarbon, the saturated part of the long chain. But the fact that it's got an acid group on the end means we wouldn't count that in our. And I, I'm saying that like it's a very specific definition of the word simple. It's going to vary from person to person. Um, that's not like one of those cases where it means for something very specific to organic chemistry. Um, in fact, some of these ones, some of the simplest looking molecules are not simple hydrocarbons by my definition. So a hydrocarbon just has hydrogen and carbon. But these middle or these three, I wouldn't call simple hydrocarbons personally. The way that I use that term, and I think I think that that's fairly standard. Benzene is its own thing. Alkenes and alkynes are their own thing. Um, so hydrocarbons with sigma bonds are your. That's that's my definition. All just a hydrocarbon with only sigma bonds is the way I would say. I would say what simple hydrocarbon means. Um, if you look at if you ask somebody like a biochemist. They might say it's below a certain size. They might even consider a benzene ring to be a simple hydrocarbon because it's below a certain size. Um, because biochemists are usually dealing with massive proteins and lipids and things like that. It's just another reference point. It's just another reference point. I saw something today that said if 32 degrees equals zero degrees, then zero plus zero equals 64. Right. It is. And so that's, it's all just a reference point. It is. It is. And that is some of the things you can run into if you don't you don't define your terms, right? Yeah, exactly. Degrees Celsius doesn't mean the same as degrees Fahrenheit. Right. <laughs> um so the, the old school way of naming these compounds were basically whoever discovered it or first isolated it got to name it. And so they would be fairly random, like formic acid was first isolated from ants. Um, if you've ever had a, you know, a bunch of black ants in your kitchen, if you squish them all at the same time, and there's that, that really distinct smell, that smell is formic acid. 
units. There's several. It's probably a dozen gas. Um, interestingly enough, most insects don't have a circulatory system. So, so basically, the formic acid is part has part of how they latch on to oxygen and hold and pull it into their cells. Um, but they don't actually have like a heart. They just have holes in their body that allow air to travel in, and then it just sort of diffuses into their body. Um, which is why if you it only takes a few generations of, of insects being exposed to higher higher than than normal oxygen levels, and they start getting really big. Um, back in the dinosaur times, we've seen pictures of like dragonflies that are this long. That's the same species of dragonfly. Just in the presence of in in those geological times, there was more oxygen in the air. More oxygen in the air meant those animals, those insects, could get larger um, without having a circulatory system. Would that same effect have on humans? No. No, <laughs> because we have a circulatory system, yeah. so we can stay the same size even as oxygen levels decrease as long as we have enough to keep our body going. Right. I'm getting that maybe we were bigger in the past with your higher- We were not, we were not. And this is also well before um, mammals were, I don't even know if mammals existed, like very early when I times, say, like Cambrian times. When I say we. <laughs> so we would have been looking at, I think we may have even been pre Dinosaurs. I don't exactly know where the cutoff is, where the Cretaceous started, where they started. If that's where they start dinosaurs being considered, then it might have even been pre dinosaur. Right. We're talking about the Cambrian explosion right after trees first developed mm -hmm. um, because there was nothing around that was able to digest or break down some of the, some of the proteins that allowed trees to grow tall. Mm -hmm. um, that was actually a big evolutionary leap because up until then, plants were only as tall as as their cells could hold them. They were missing a certain a couple of key proteins that allow trees to be trees and grow up tall. So it was all bushes. Um, I think so. It was all bushes yeah. um, until then, and then when trees first developed, there was nothing that could break down those those compounds, those proteins. Like the trees wouldn't rot. They would just, when they died, they would just fall and get carried covered up, but wouldn't rot. And so it created these carbon sinks underneath the surface of the earth where you, and so we actually had a, a decrease and plus there was a huge boom in the number of, of plants. So we had less CO2 and more oxygen because the trees were actually being sequestering carbon um, in what eventually for the most part turned into fossil fuels. Um, but that that result of having extra oxygen and not as much CO two allowed the insects to get you know much larger than they do um, anymore. Um, moving past formic acid, uh, urea was the birth of organic chemistry, right? Because they first they isolated it from urine, and but then they accidentally um, synthesized it in the lab. And that's what kind of led to, they were trying to make a different isothiocyanate compound um, by heating certain, certain cyanate molecules and they accidentally made urea synthetically. Um, but because it was first isolated from urine, they called it urea. There's no, there's no reason why this molecule should be called urea other than it came from urine. Um, some of the more random ones, um, morphine is named after the Greek god of dreams, Morpheus. Um, the same Morpheus from Sandman on the Netflix series of the comics, if you read those. Um, and then Alfred von Bayer, that is, I, I always mix this up, related to but not the same Bayer as Bayer aspirin. There were two Bayers in Germany in the early, in the early 1900s. Um, that uh, both were very prevalent in organic chemistry, one of which first uh, made aspirin in the lab, um, and that's Bayer aspirin without the, e, the first E. This Bayer <laughs> made barbiturates. Um, 
and he named in honor of a woman named Barbara, which incidentally was not his wife. His wife's name was not Barbara. So we don't know who Barbara was, but we know that, that Adolf was not married to Barbara. So you can see that there's not a whole lot of rhyme or reason to these names, right? They're all sort of just like, I discovered it, I get to name it, the way that we handle like asteroids and things like that now. Um, I can speculate into Barbara. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to figure out what was going on there, and then uh, we all was in trouble at home probably after that. <laughs> um, so to get away from just doing random names, we use what are called systematic names. And these days, so there are a couple of different ways, systematic ways to name organic compounds, but for the most part in this class, we're going to use what's called the IUPAC nomenclature. IUPAC stands for International Union of Practical and Applied Chemists. It's basically a worldwide entity who has the final say on anything chemistry related when it comes to naming things. So the IUPAC as a whole um, will they're the ones who finalize the new names for new elements and things like that. When new, so the discoverer gets to propose the name for the new elements, but the IUPAC then votes on it. Um, so they're, they're also the final say in here is our official system that's universal for naming organic compounds. All right, so the IUPAC name for naming alkanes <coughs> is the first step is always going to be find your longest continuous carbon chain. Um, a lot of times we call it the parent chain or the parent molecule. Um, and it doesn't have to be written from left to right. As long as we have all sp3 carbons, these are all tetrahedral and can rotate around pretty freely, right? And so our longest continuous carbon chain you ju just means you start at one end and you keep counting until you get to the other, to another end. And whatever the longest possible chain you can make by doing that, that's your, your going to be your parent molecule. So in this case, we could, if we just counted left to right, we could look at it and see. One, two, three, four, five, six, or we, if we turn the corner here, five, six, seven, or if we turn the corner again, and we can see where this is, where we're going with this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So our longest continuous carbon, and it, it doesn't matter where else you count, you start counting, you can't get more than nine in this, um, in the structure, so our long, our parent molecule we do it in green, it looks like it's a, a cartoon snake. Um, Quick question. Yeah. Would a carbocation be considered an alkane still? Since it's just hydrocarbons? No, we would just call it a carbocation. We would, we would name it as, we would name the molecule like normal, and then we'd say, whatever that name is, carbocation. Um, or Frank, more, more likely, honestly, is we would draw the structure. Because that's the way to do it unambiguously. All right, so our longest continuous carbon chain is nine here. And then to give that our perfect, or our appropriate numerical prefix, so whatever your longest continuous chain is, there's there are prefixes that go past ten. Typically, most things that are that are more than ten carbons long are going to have a common name. Like you mentioned, oleic acid earlier. Oleic acid is not the IUPAC name for oleic acid because oleic acid is basically a it's a humongous chain of right. <laughs> and I think it's it's like 16 carbons in a row. So it would be like dohexa 
dohexanoic acid or dodecahexanoic acid or something like that. Yeah. But we just anything bigger than 10, we just see most of them are going to have a common name that's more commonly used. Um, so really the ones that I'm most worried about you memorizing are getting up to 10. Um, and once you get past four, they're the standard Greek prefixes. Pent, hex, hept, oct, known, dec, just like we've seen in the past. Um, but the more common prefixes that we see used all the time in organic chemistry are one to four carbons long. And so to avoid, to be able to use both the standard Greek um, as well as these at the same time without making it complicated, um, <clears throat> We have these these other set that are basically only used for organic chemistry. So meth means one, eth means two, prop means three, but means four. And the reason why we don't use mono ditri tetra is so that we can say things like diethyl. If we didn't have eth as a separate prefix, it would be di diethyl. And you wind up with them stacking up and does the diethyl, does the first diethyl mean this or does it mean that? So we use this basically to avoid that. Once you get past this, you can have something like a pentapental group, um, but it's pretty uncommon once you get past those first four. So we don't worry about that as much. Um, <clears throat> so if we start by drawing, <clears throat> excuse me, malcane, with the formula C3H8. We haven't done a whole lot of practice with drawing these constitutional isomers yet, but try drawing a structure with three carbons and eight hydrogens. So complete structure. It's gonna look like this. If we did it right, going back to a couple of weeks ago now, all of our carbons should have four bonds, all of our hydrogens should have one bond. And this is really the only way you can do, you can draw the structure so that all of your carbons have four bonds and all your hydrogens have one bond. Um, we can't put a hydrogen in the middle. We can't put more than four <laughs> bonds to a carbon. Can't put a double bond or else it's used. And we can't put a double bond or else it wouldn't be C3H8. You can think of a double bond. Um, the reason they're, the term saturated applies to how many hydrogens you have attached for the number of carbons. So if you have unsaturated, it's usually a lot of double bonds. Or even just one double, just bond. One double bond. The most, the most hydrogens you can have with three carbons is eight. Saturated hydrocarbons always have the same general formula, CnH 2n plus two. All right, so, this is saturated, which means we know it doesn't have a ring and doesn't have any double bonds. Um, as soon as you, we took two of these away to make it a double bond, uh, now it's not saturated anymore because it could have more pi or more hydrogens. Skeletal structure for this is going to look pretty simple too. Yep. Usually keep it about 120 degrees, but as long as you're close. Um, it wouldn't be wrong. I guess it wouldn't be wrong to just draw it like that, right? You have to put those little kinks in it so that you know that there's a carbon yeah. Exactly. Um, and really, we probably wouldn't draw skeletal structure for anything smaller than than three carbons. This wouldn't be straight, though, would it? It wouldn't be. It would all be tetrahedral. Right, so you wouldn't draw, so you wouldn't draw a straight. Angle. People yeah. have the tendency, because we think in 90 degree angles, so we have four things around a carbon, we're going to draw it 90 degrees. So the tendency to draw complete structures 
straight across like this. For the skeletal, skeletal structures, we always want to show that angle a little bit better. All right, so if we have three, we have three carbons in a row, our longest continuous carbon chain is three. Right, so anytime we've got a simple hydrocarbon, no double bonds, no other elements present, its name is always going to end in ain. Just like alkane does. So alkane is the class of molecules. Any specific molecules in that class, their name ends in ain to show that that's what type of molecule they are. They are. So three carbons is our longest continuous carbon chain. So it's going to be pro. And then to say that it's a an alkane, we throw ain. If you change the suffix, the back half of this name, that's basically changing what functional groups you're saying are present. If it was an alkene, if it was that molecule, our longest continuous carbon chain is still three, but it's not an alkene anymore. It's an alkene, so we name it propene. And we'll get to all those other suffixes and all the ways we, we amend this later, but the the back half of this name, so the front half of this name is always what's your longest continuous carbon chain, the back half is what functional groups do you have? All right, C4H10, try that one. We know it's got to be saturated again, just from the formula, right? <clears throat> so, and it can be, this is definitely a case where once you get the complete structure, the skeletal structure is actually easier to see what's happening here. Because we don't actually care about the hydrogens when it comes to naming things, right? So they just sort of get in the way and make it hard to see what's going on. So our longest continuous carbon chain is four. So it's not propane anymore. Now it's butane. And we go more than that, we get pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, decane. Excuse me. Excuse me. I don't know if it's an old thing. I think that's a thing. Or I think it's a uh, my, my kids jump when I sneeze in the other room, and I don't like. I think it's a. I've been told it's a dad sneezes is a thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, it really did start when I had my first kid. I started <laughs> not being able to sneeze without waking people up. Um, what about the isomer? Well, we, what this so one, I can have different isomers. Exactly. What's the other isomer going to look like? That's well, less. We can still draw it. It still has. Instead of having all four carbons in in straight line, this is adding what we what I usually refer to as a branch. Everything still has four bonds. All of our carbons still have four bonds. We still have the right formula, right? So this is a constitutional isomer where it's not the same. One of the ways we know it's not the same molecule is we can't have a longest continuous carbon chain of four anymore. Now our longest continuous carbon chain is only three, but we can't just name it propane because it's not the same as regular propane. So we, we adjust the names by adding prefixes to sort of modify it. So our longest continuous carbon chain is still three, so we'd still name it as the parent molecule would still be propane. 
attached to that. And then we have another group attached to that that we indicate with a with another prefix. So then we only have, it's one carbon that's attached, and our one carbon base name is meth. And to indicate that it's a um, it's a branch, not a parent molecule, we say methyl. We add YL instead of adding mean. So what added YL says this one carbon prefix is attached to this parent molecule. And with like a molecule that small, you don't have to like indicate the position of the methyl because it's kind of already like assumed that it's it can only be it can only be in one spot. Yeah. Right. What happens if we try if we try to attach this green one yeah. somewhere else? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now it's four carbons in a row. Either spot, exactly. In fact, and if we, so if we had something like, a butane with a methyl group, then you would indicate it as like the shortest, like the smallest amount of carbons away from the, each end. But if we took this molecule, if we flipped it over like a pancake, then it looks like this one, right? In other words, these are the same molecule. And if we follow our rules for naming them, um, it becomes pretty easy to see that. So for this top one, it's for longest continuous carbon chain is four, so it's a but, still just an alkane, so it's butane. It has a methyl group attached. And if if we're not sure if there's more than one place you could put a methyl group to make it a different molecule, we add what's called a locant, which is basically where is this methyl group attached? It's just a, a, a prefix on a prefix. Um, and the simplest way that we do that is just by using a number. How many carbons is it from the end? So we can say this is 2-methylbutene. But the thing the is, bottom one is also this one is also 2-methylbutene. So the key with these low hands is we want to keep them as low as possible. So here's four carbons in a row. As our longest continuous carbon chain, it doesn't matter which end of the chain we start counting from. So one, two, or one, two. So in this case, two methyl butane, the two is actually unnecessary. So you can just call it methyl just methyl butane. We're going to keep keep doing more practice with this. So here are the two isomers that we were just talking about drawn in 3D um, structures. Here's our butane, four carbons in a continuous chain. So this is C4H10. Here's four or three carbons in a chain with a methyl group. So this is our methyl, methyl propane, also C4H10. But they can't have the same name because they're not the same molecule. They're not, the atoms aren't connected the same way. To turn this molecule into this molecule, we would actually have to pull a hydrogen off of here and pull, break a carbon carbon bond and then reattach things. So if you have to break chemical bonds in order to, to go from one molecule to another molecule, they're two different compounds. That example we did a second ago versus we don't have to break any bonds to make this one, the left one, look like the right one. All we have to do is take it and flip it over and we get everything in the same spot, right? So if you can just twist it around or flip it over to make the two look the same, then they're not isomers, they're the same molecule. And it's, there's a fine line 
it gets kind of hard to distinguish between those. Is it the same molecule or is it two different isomers? And one of the ways to check that is to name them. Get, if you get good at naming your alkanes, if we name both of these, they both come up as, as two methyl butane, which means they're actually the same molecule. We can't name these and get the same name. We get butane versus methyl propane. The fact that they have different names means they're different molecules, they're different compounds. Um, and they will, we also can see differences in physical properties. These two molecules have slightly different boiling points. They have slightly different enthalpy of combustion. If you burn them, butane will give you about eight kilojoules per mole, or sorry, four extra kilojoules per mole in terms of, of the enthalpy of the reaction. Um, so they're, they're not the same molecule, even though they have the same formula and that we reflect that by having different names for them. That's the whole goal with the IUPAC nomenclature is to make it systemic as possible so that you can, all you have to do is follow a procedure and make it really, really clear that if you get a different name, it's a different molecule. Or if you have two different compounds, they must have unambiguously different names. You never want to name two different isomers the same thing. That means you did something wrong. You missed something somewhere. All right, and so that's that's the key here. There will be a few times where there's a couple ways of writing the name or two different names that are both equally valid according to the rules that I'm going to teach you. If that's the case, then then that's fine. A molecule, a compound can have two different names as long as either of those two names will allow you to draw the right compound. That's right. the whole point of the name is you have to draw the exact compound. Exactly. Just the name. Exactly. And you, if you do your naming properly, if it's an unambiguous name, there should be no way that you get two possible compounds. It's possible to have one compound with two unambiguous names, but you can't go the other way around. Does that make sense? All right, so here's our steps for naming branched alkanes. Get your longest continuous carbon chain, just like before. In this case, for this molecule, it's five continuous carbons. So it's gonna be pent. It's still just all single bonds, so we know it's going to be ain. But if there was another functional group, whatever, however we would normally name that parent molecule, name the parent molecule. For now, all we know is ain, so everything's going to end in ain. And then you add a prefix to indicate the size of the side chain or the branch. And if necessary, describe where the same side chain is located, which in this case would be three. All right, and so this one, the locant, is necessary. If you're not sure, it's always better to be redundant than it is to be ambiguous. So if you're not sure if you need to put a number on it, put a number on it. Because in this case, we could have... Two methyl pentane or three methyl pentane, but you can't have four methyl pentane. Because <laughs> that would just be that would just be hexane or sorry. What what about one methyl pentane? That's one methyl pentane. It's hexane. Four methyl pentane is two oh. methyl pentane. Yeah. So we always want to make sure we count from the lowest end and keep that number as low as possible. So, and it can be a little bit tricky to, um, to name them when all you have is the 3D structure. So if you get the 3D structure, like our textbook, 
has all of the nomenclature practice problems. It just gives you the 3D structure. For me, at least, the first, easiest way to do this is start by redrawing it as the skeletal structure. And obviously, we've used some of these as examples already. So three, three continuous carbons with a methyl group attached. So methyl propane. Um, and also, like most textbooks say that this should be one word or hyphenated if you have to break it up across lines. But and and methyl propane is not that bad to look at. But as we start getting longer and longer prefixes as and longer and longer compound names, that starts getting harder. So I typically just always put a, put a dash in there just between the prefix and the parent name. Could never have two ethyl propane, right? So that changes it completely. So, what would two ethyl propane look like? So, there's our propyl group if we had an ethyl attached to it. It's got that two. Yeah. Now, our longest continuous carbon chain isn't three anymore. Right? So, it looks like that would be a branch, but our longest continuous carbon chain then is there, not here. So there's a limit to the possibilities. There are, especially with small molecules. As you get longer and longer molecules, it gets more and more complex. You have more degrees of freedom, the more carbons you have. Right. So here's the example we did on the previous page. Our longest continuous carbon chain is five. We can count that either way. Doesn't matter which way we circle it. We could make this our longest continuous carbon chain, or this our longest continuous carbon chain. Both cases, we're going to get two methyl pentane. There, if you have two distinct ways that you could get to five, either one of them is valid. And how about here? So our longest continuous carbon chain is we go that way, it's five. I guess might as well. No matter which end we start counting at, we get five. Right? So it doesn't doesn't matter either way, it's gonna be a pentane. And then it's just a matter of where is our our branch and how big is it? And this is the first time we've seen a branch that's bigger than one. If it's a branch that's bigger than one, we don't use methyl as the prefix. We use the ethyl because ethyl indicates two. So ethyl pentane, and if necessary, we say where the ethyl group is. So we can say, Three ethyl pentane. It wouldn't be necessary in this though, right? Yeah. Because what happens if you had two, what would two ethyl pentane look like? It would just change the three methyl pentane. So let's draw our pentane. Now our longest continuous carbon chain isn't five anymore. It's six. not it's six. Yeah. So two ethyl pentane is really Three methyl hexane. Right, so number fundamental rule is find your longest continuous carbon chain. <laughs> right and, back your head. <laughs> right, that's that's going to continue to be, and we're going to get really good at this because every other functional group group we're going to add is going to have its own naming way to name it. 
but they're all based on the same fundamental system. All we're gonna do is add new prefixes and new suffixes, but it's still always gonna be find your longest continuous carbon chain, use these numeric prefixes, and then add modifiers to it. What happens if you have multiple branches? Well, you add multiple prefixes. So our longest, this is still going to be, if I, if I translate this to skeletal structure, our longest continuous carbon chain here is still five. So it's still pentane. If we didn't have this top branch, it would be two methyl pentane, right? Or if it didn't have this methyl group, it would be three ethyl pentane. So if it's got both of those branches, you just put two prefixes on them. So three ethyl, two methyl pentane. And this is why I don't get, as we start getting to larger molecules, technically that three is not necessary because the ethyl can only go on the center carbon, just like we talked about. But it starts looking funny to say ethyl, two methyl pentane, to not have the number on the ethyl group when it's another branch, just like the methyl. Um, I don't, I don't mind I, like I said, I always rather be redundant than ambiguous. So when in doubt, include that number. Do you want to include the bigger number first, like you have here? So I'm not going to be picky as long as both of those prefixes there. This is an unambiguous name, and it would be if I switched these two as well. Right? I would still draw the same molecule. Different textbooks tell you different ways to keep them in order. Usually they say alphabetize the prefixes. So ethyl would come before methyl. Um, but what if it's dimethyl? Do you alphabetize it as M or D? And textbooks disagree on that. So if the textbooks can't agree on it, then I'm not going to be picky about it. But technically, you are supposed to put these in alphabetical order. I'm not going to mark you down as long as it's unambiguous. And so the, and the numbers don't really matter. As long as you can draw the structure from the name. As long as I can get the correct structure with no ambiguity. Don't have dashes. And the dashes, same thing. Um, tip it, it's, you almost always see dashes between the numbers and the, and the prefixes. That's the one that you, you pretty much have to. Um, it makes more sense to me to have the number attached to the group and then separated by dashes. I don't think anybody, nobody would get confused by that. It's just not the standard way of writing it. Yeah, standard measurement system is <laughs> Standard is not that standard. <laughs> yeah. It's a line from, anybody see the old, um, the old movie from the 90s, 12 Monkeys, with Bruce Willis and then he's Jodie Foster. Um, Sci-fi movie, but there's, science isn't exact science with these morons or something like that. <laughs> random uncertainty of where they got sent back in time. Um, so the standardization is not exactly standardized, and that's okay as long as our names are unambiguous. Gotcha. If you have multiple branches of the same length, now this is where we throw in those Greek prefixes. So if you have two branches that are both methyl groups, you say dimethyl. Exactly. But would you still indicate the positions with numbers? So you would, like, for example, if it was like you had a methyl group on the three position and two position. So like that be two, three dimethyl. Exactly. It's still pentane. But this you could have two four dimethyl. You could have two four dimethyl, you could have two two dimethyl. Yeah. So anytime you say die, you're just saying that it's two, there's two of the, 
not that they're necessarily on the same carbon. And you would still, uh, still add the low cam. Exactly. This is where the low cam really comes in. Right, yeah. exactly. And so anytime you see dye, you've got to have two low cams in front of it. Um, where the other thing people have a tendency to do is to split this up. If they're not attached to the same carbon, they'll say two methyl, three methyl. So it gets redundant. It yeah. gets redundant. It's extra writing for no reason. It's just more compact way to do it. Once you know the rules, it's really consistent. Um, the other thing that people will do is if, if it looked like this, you can have two methyls on the same carbon, right? If it's, it'll do this. It's just three. That's not the right way. You got to specify where both methyls are. Yeah. So it's a three, three dimethyl. So anytime you see dimethyl, there's got to be th two numbers. Anytime you see tri, there's got to be three numbers. If you have a number, if you have two numbers, you need a suffix. And if you have two, <laughs> if you have two numbers, you've got to have the prefix on there. You can't have three three methyl. It's three three dimethyl. You have to have that. It's like like verb agreement. You can't say you can't mix up what the conjugation of the verb that way. So if it's um, just three three methyl, it's like oh, which methyl? What is yeah, you know, like, I mean, there, it's one of those cases like where somebody breaks a grammar rule, but everybody still understands what they're trying to say, but you'll get weird looks. Yeah. Um, if you said three dimethyl or three three methyl, both of those would probably people would probably get to be able to get to the same structure. <laughs> but that's like be a little, like, that's like saying eight in a formal in a formal essay. You don't <laughs> do that, even though everybody knows what it means. It's not the official way to do it. All right, so one more and we'll take our break. <laughs> so we've got our longest continuous carbon chain. The six. So we know it's going to be hexane. We've got two branches. The reason that I like drawing these out of scale structure and then actually circling the parent molecule is because when you circle the parent molecule, whatever sticks out from that has to be named as a branch. So it gives you a really good visual indicator. Hey, I need to say um, that I've got two branches. I've got two things that stick out from my parent molecule circle. So our, we have two methyl groups that are both on carbon three. So this is the exact example we were just talking about. So this is going to be dimethyl and because they're both on carbon three, if there are two ways that we can count, we count from the way I just want to reiterate to keep the numbers as low as possible. We could say, Four four dimethyl, and that is an unambiguous name. You would get the right one, but you just want to keep the numbers we, lower. The general rule is keep the numbers as low as possible, and that will wind up being a bigger deal when we start adding more functional groups. So if we get the hang of that now, it'll help us later. So four four dimethyl is not the proper name. Three three dimethyl hexane. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at, at uh, 11 and we'll do some more practice, add a couple of new wrinkles.
going on. All right, so to keep going here, just like with everything in chemistry, um, I guess OCHEM in particular um, has this habit of as soon as you get comfortable with something, we add a new wrinkle that makes it hard again. I mean, we just keep building, just like a math class, right? Um, so these prefixes we might not be super comfortable with them yet, but we kind of understand what's going on. Halogens are the simplest functional group that we're going to add to the alkanes. Um, and they really, they barely count as a functional group. Because basically with the halogen, all you're doing is you're replacing a hydrogen with a halogen. So if it was C4H10, you take away one of those hydrogens and put a fluorine on. Because the halogens all only make one bond as well, it's pretty easy to just look at it as replacing a hydrogen. It turns out they have, there's more function behind that, but they are more reactive than a hydrogen. So it does wind up making a difference. But as far as these structures go, it's not a very complicated functional group. And so we name it just like we would name a branch with a prefix. Um, and the prefixes aren't I'm gonna end in YL. Prefixes ending in YL is specifically for alkanes. So instead, what do you suppose the prefix is for chlorine? So if it's a prefix, we're going to tap it on the front, so it's chloro, not chloro. Yeah. Is in the IUPAX, in the old school way of naming it, we would call it an alkyl halide. We so we'd say it's hexane, hexine chloride. But that doesn't give us a convenient place to put the locant. So we just treat it like it's a prefix instead. This is still going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's hexane. Instead of saying hexane chloride, we see we say two chloro hexane. And then also any other branches that happen to be on there. This one has a methyl group. So that means it's going to be three methyl two chlorohexane. <clears throat> All right, so I num when I counted the hexane, one, two, three, four, five, six, I counted from left to right just out of convenience. But if we're trying to keep these numbers as low as possible, we would actually want to start counting from the other side. So let's do the one right under that. What's our longest continuous carbon chain here? Just two. So our parent molecule <clears throat> is going to be ethane. And then we have two chlorines, so it's going to be dichloro. Di 
But with that one, you don't really have to like put the little can just because there's no other there way. There is because you can oh. put them on the same carbon. Oh, oh okay. So, so you do have to specify. Especially when there's two of them. If it was just chloroethane, you're right. Whatever chlorine has or whatever carbon has the chlorine is carbon one. But in this case, because you could have one one dichloroethane or one two dichloroethane, we do want to specify where both of them are. You can't have two two dichloroethane because we would just start counting from the other side then. What's our longest continuous carbon chain for the top right? Yeah, and there's a couple ways we can count it, but they all wind up giving us the same, the same parent molecule, it's gonna be hexane again. And this is a hexane, we've got a methyl group and a bromo group. How are we going to count? Uh, putting the bromine on the lowest number. Yeah, so we could say we can count from either and, and have two methyl five bromo, or we could have two bromo five methyl. The numbers are the same either way, right? So there's no, just by looking at keeping the numbers low, it's not entirely clear which way we should start counting. Usually, whatever is, whatever we've learned more recently is going to have a priority. We kind of were starting with the very basic. Um, and as we add more wrinkles, so if we have to choose between the bromine gets to be two and the methyl is five or the other way around, we're going to give the bromine the priority. So we're going to say it's two bromo, five methyl. That's one of those ones where if you numbered it the other way, it was still an unambiguous name. It's just not the most technically correct way to do it. So there was a chlorine instead of a methyl group. See, and now that gets tricky, right? Are we talking which one's bigger? Or is it uh, usually, yes. We go with the, with the bromine would go and um, get the lower numbering in that case if we're splitting hairs. Then what about here? What's our longest continuous carbon chain? And how should we count it? <laughs> Can we do it that way? Yeah, but then it just confuses your branch. Then your branch has a branch, kind of, right? Yeah. Then you've got a complicated, what we call a complicated branch. So if there's a way that you can count three and keep it so that your fluorine is part of that main group, that main molecule, um, that's usually a better idea. We'll learn how to name the complicated branches. So we could count it the other way, but this is a better way to do it. So this is going to be propane. One or two methyl. We've got a fluorine. So fluoro on carbon one. So one fluoro, two methyl. And again, the most technically correct way to write this would be one fluoro, two methyl to get to alphabetize. But again, I'm not going to be picky about the order of the prefixes. So the order of the numbers doesn't matter. It's just the alphabetization of it. Correct. Um, and also note about the autocorrect on Canvas with these. I'm if there's more than one way to order these. I'm not going to take the time to type in five different names that are all equally valid if there's more than one way to do it. I'm not going to. Um, so I'm just going to write it once. 
and it'll get marked as fully wrong by the auto grader because the auto grader doesn't do partial credit or doesn't understand if there's any deviation. Like if you put a space instead of the height of the dash, it's going to get marked as fully wrong. Just know that when I come back through and do partial credit, that'll be a full credit answer. It's just going to show you the answer so that you can check yourself, but don't be too, don't panic when you see a zero out of two on that problem because you forgot a space or something like that. Um, and before we get to those, just to get out of. So, what do we do if we have a complicated branch? If the, and by what I mean by that is if the branch has a branch. So, here's a molecule. This is unambiguously our longest continuous carbon chain. There's no other way we can count to make the branches simple. Like that's what we just did with the fluorine example, right? We could pick three in a row, but that made the branch complicated. So we counted three the other way. We're allowed to do that if it gets the same longest continuous carbon chain. You could pick the branch that's more convenient for naming things. In this case, there's no other way to count it that gets us to, what is that, seven? Yeah. So we can't get to seven starting here or here. <laughs> so if that's the case, that means our branch itself has a branch. When you think about it, is the carbon that's directly attached to the parent molecule is carbon one of the branch. So we have to start counting here. And we say, okay, well that's a two carbon branch that also has a methyl group attached to the branch itself. The methyl group is not attached to the main molecule, the parent molecule, it's attached to the branch. And so the way we would name this is our, color code this, our longest continuous carbon chain still makes this heptane. Then on the heptane, there's an ethyl group. So, ethyl heptane, except that then the ethyl has a methyl. And the way that we indicate that the methyl, we're, gonna, we're still going to say methyl on here as well, but to indicate how the methyl is attached to the ethyl group instead of the heptane, we're going to say methyl, ethyl, and we're going to put it in parentheses. Right, so the parentheses are just to indicate the methyl applies to the ethyl, the methyl doesn't apply to the heptane. And then this whole group within parentheses gets a locant. So it's on carbon four of the heptane. So this would be four methyl ethyl heptane. And you can put a hyphen between those, you can smash them together again or to use a space, however you want to do it. The main thing is the parentheses are indicating this is a branch applied to a branch. So if that other branch is like longer then you'd still use like low camps, but just in the parentheses dot. Correct. Yeah. So Did we get to some of that at the end of, of Gen Chem last year? Yeah. A little bit? It's exactly, so the ultimate way of naming it would be to just call that an isopropyl. Um, I wouldn't mark it wrong unless I asked for the IUPAC name. Is this isopropyl? It's not IUPAC. Right? And so, and we see that used all the isopropyl alcohol, right? Um, isopropyl alcohol is an isopropyl group attached to an alcohol group. So it's actually our longest continuous carbon chain is a propane. So we would name it as Propane is the parent molecule. So um, ISO isn't IUPAC uh, so mm -hmm. Correct. Prefix. Yeah. Um, so like all those. All those other ones. And, and so you can have an isobutyl group. An isobutyl group looks like this. It's in the ISO, it's the same ISO as an isosceles triangle, it means that two sides are the same. 
So basically you could say one, two, three, or you could say one, two, three, and get the same length of the chain. That's what makes it an ISO group. That gets a little bit tricky to, to consistently apply, especially due to larger branches. Um, could it not be tertiary as well? Isobutyl? An isobutyl group is going to be a terbutyl group, which is going to look like. Yeah. So basically, to get away from having to use all these different ways of naming them, the, instead of memorizing these and all the different geometry that goes with them, the easiest way to do these complicated branches is with the parentheses. It's the most powerful way, and it's going to be the most consistent. Learn how to do it once, and you don't need to worry about the difference between secbutyl and isobutyl. All right, so with that in mind, in mind using those uh, prefixes, let's go back to this. And again, I grabbed this out of a out of a uh, textbook. Um, so it has iso the isopropyl is the same thing as methyl ethyl in parentheses. The isobutyl methyl propyl. So let's let's look at isobutyl. Here our longest continuous carbon chain. This is actually one where if we counted differently, we could get seven and make it our lives simpler. There are two ways you can count and get a parent molecule of seven. Um, but for the sake of this exercise, let's do it like this first. Oh, you there on that one. Yeah, exactly. Um, we would still say, okay, our longest continuous carbon chain on the branch is one, two, Three. So in parentheses, propyl, and then there's a methyl group attached to the propyl group on carbon two of the propyl group. Carbon one of the branch is always what's directly attached to the parent molecule. You always have to start counting here when we're talking about a branch. So on the second carbon of the branch, there's a methyl. So inside the parentheses, we would say two methyl propyl. And then we'd stick another locant in front of that to say it's on carbon four of the heptane. So would uh, one methyl propyl be like? would be if we attached it there. Yeah. So in the old school way of naming it, that'd be a secbutyl group, and this is an isobutyl group. But again, I I don't like those other, especially if you get anything well, larger than isopropyl. Using, yeah. We'll still, I'll still use the term isopropyl sometimes because that's a really common prefix and there's only like, one way to arrange it. Other ones like sec. Once you get to the butyl groups, it's really complicated to try and use. So yeah. ignore it. Just get good at the parentheses and you don't need to worry about it as much. So our final name for this one would be four two methyl propyl close parentheses heptane. And you can also see how it gets to be a bit of a mouthful. How do you say that unambiguously? Uh, and that is one of the one of the reasons why some of those older prefixes have still hung around is because it makes it really obvious. If I said four sec butyl heptane, then that's then you don't need to worry about it. Four four two methyl. Like how where do the parentheses go? Because we don't typically in our speech say open parentheses and close parentheses, but that is the way you would have to say it verbally. Before open parentheses, two methyl propyl close parentheses heptane. Too curious to do it. Right. 
Um, so this is the other way I can ask these questions too. We've been focusing on here's a structure, how do we name it? Going from the name to the structure, I typically find easier um, because the, the name itself will remember some, remind you of some of the rules that you might forget if you're coming up for the name yourself. Um, so we'll do a couple of these. Let's do E up here first, and then we'll do a couple of the bottom ones. Our longest continuous carbon chain is five carbons in a row. And again, it might be helpful to redraw it as a skeletal structure. So five carbons in a row, one, two, three, four, five. Got a methyl group here, a methyl group here, a methyl group here, and a methyl group here. And those are all the branches that are sticking out here. So it's going to be pentane. It's got four methyls. Tetramethyl. And then you just add all of the cans. Exactly. Two, two, so four, two, two, four, four. Two, two, four, four. Tetramethyl. Tetramethyl pentane. Nothing we haven't seen before other than we just haven't used the word tetra before. But other than that, this is why this is such a, a, it really is a very elegant system that's been designed that allows you to name, write really complex names for complex molecules by following the same rules that you use for everything else. How about this one here? Three methyl ethyl, two, three, six, seven tetramethyl monomine. <laughs> No name. I like that as a name. No name. No name. <laughs> could be a could be a rapper from Chicago. Wait, that's no name. So when you start from the name and get the structure, I like to start from the back and work my way forward. Get the parent molecule drawn and then just start tacking stuff onto it. So start by drawing a no name. Just don't forget and common, common stumbling block with drawing these is say one when you first put your pencil down. We're gonna try and draw nine carbons. Your tendency is gonna say one, two, three, and count up to nine. But you're already missing one. But you're already missing one. So save one when you put your pencil down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then we've got three isopropyl. Two, three, six, seven tetramethyl. Two, three. Four, five, six, seven. That's a relatively complicated alkane with lots of branches. So there's there's probably not a better way. There's not a better way that you could count to, to eliminate using the prefixes. Just because like the methyl groups are so spaced out as well that you can't really exactly if you really if you start like counting, or it's yeah. an isopropyl on three. It's an isopropyl either way. Either way you count. Going back to this example, we didn't I didn't finish. The better way to count here, there's a way we can count and still get seven in a row that doesn't give us a oh, complicated branch. And if we started counting here and went along there, <laughs> that's still seven in a row. So that's still heptene. So now it's just a lot, the brand, the side branches are a lot simpler. To now, it's, now we have two branches yeah. instead of one branch, but both of them are simpler. So this one would be a 
two methyl one or two, three, four, four propyl. This is actually probably not a better name, but they both follow our rules for find your longest continuous carbon chain and then just name branches, right? And it's easy to see why this can be a mistake because it's two methyl four propyl instead of four two methyl propyl. Right. <laughs> and so that's why when we're saying these names out loud, we have to be careful with the way we say them. But I would accept both of these as, as valid answers because they both will unambiguously give you the same structure. But when we can just change our counting to make it so that we have more branches, but they're each simpler, that's the better option usually. But the one we did a second ago, this one, we couldn't do that because whether we count here or here as our as carbon one, the other one turns into an isopropyl. Either this is carbon one and this is an isopropyl, or this is carbon one and that's an isopropyl. So sometimes it's a there's not a difference. So don't don't worry about it too much. If it doesn't seem obvious how you could change that. The main thing is longest continuous carbon chain. There's always a methyl on two on this, there's always an isopropyl on three. Right. So that's methyl on three. So no matter how you look at it. Exactly. It's actually kind of an, an elegantly designed problem from a <laughs> from an instructor's point of view. They drew that, they made that one really nicely so that there was no good, but better way to count without going through the, the brute force solution as the instructors to just make it make it decade instead of no name. Because mm -hmm. you can always just make the parent molecule longer <laughs> and force them to count that way. But this is actually a more clever way. All right. Last wrinkle we're going to add today, and we're just going to do some practice, is cyclogroups. And it's pretty straightforward. If you have carbons connected in a ring structure, we use the prefix cyclo. It's still named as, a, as an alkane. If it's six carbons in a row in a ring structure, though, we just say it's cycloalpexane. It's still hexane because there's still six connected in a row. Our longest continuous carbon chain is still six, but it's not an open chain. It's in that ring structure, so we say cyclo. And, and it's not C6H14 anymore, it's C6H12. It's C6H12. It's no longer saturated as soon as you add an extra carbon carbon bond. Whether that extra carbon carbon bond is um, is a sigma bond or a pi bond, doesn't matter. You added an extra carbon carbon bond and that took away two hydrogens. And you can have cyclic structures that are lower than hexane as well. You can. Um, in fact, there's a bit of a so you can go try, try, try and this very good. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Just trying. So cyclopentane, cyclobutane, cyclopropane, those do exist. They typically are very unstable yeah. because we're forcing those bonds to be closer than they want to be just because of the geometry. Um, and it's actually a bit of a, a uh, organic chemistry meme um, to say that um, ethene is a two carbon ring. <laughs> Not really true, right? We know the difference between sigma bonds and pi bonds. This is a sigma bond and a pi bond. These are all sigma bonds. However, you could argue that that's cycloethane. You'd be wrong, but it'd be funny. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm going to play the devil's advocate. Say that's a circle. <laughs> it is. It's a two, a, except that you can't have a two sided polygon. Mm, that's true. If these cyclogroups require are all polygons, you can't have a two-sided polygon by definition. But that's on a 2D space, and we know these are 3D molecules. <laughs> right, exactly. So polyhedron, but either way, um, 
the main thing, we wouldn't obviously name that that, that way, we name that as alkenes because the pi bond gets a different character. Um, but basically, yeah, you can have any size and you can go bigger than this. In fact, usually at some point on a test, I'm gonna make you draw a seven-sided ring. Just because even if, when you get good at hexagons and octagons, drawing a seven-sided ring, a heptagon, is actually a lot harder than you think. Um, you are hard to I can only draw hexagons. <laughs> and the way that I usually draw a, um, if you've got a hexagon and an octagon, The way I draw a heptagon is I draw the bottom half of, a, of an octagon and the top half of a hexagon and I connect them. It's not perfect, but it gets it close. Like kind of just looks like an egg. It looks like a polka A little bit, yeah. You could, and if you did it, if I did it a little bit better, then this would be more like a, like that. You can see a little bit more, but the main thing is, I'm not going to judge you on how pretty your polygons are, <laughs> as long as I can count the number of sides. If we just put dots in there to clear up which, <laughs> where the vertices are. That would be fine, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but also, on a test, I know what I'm, I know what I asked you. If I asked you to draw a cycloheptane, um, then I know I'm looking for you to give me something that's not a hexagon and not an octagon. <laughs> if you give me something halfway in between, that's going to be good or bad, because... Right. I'm, I know what I'm looking for. Um, so when we, and naming these are the same way as normal. It, find your longest continuous carbon chain, make that your parent molecule at a branch. The trick with these is that with the cyclo groups, with the rings, you never count into the ring or out of the ring. It could be argued that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that our longest continuous carbon chain is seven. It's not wrong, but that would make it really impossible to name consistently. Yeah. So what we do instead is we just arbitrarily say you never count out of a ring or into a ring. You count up to a ring and then the ring starts. Right, so for the, in this case, our longest continuous carbon chain then is a five. So it's going to be cyclopentane. And then we say our cyclopentane has an ethyl group on it. Can I also say one cycloheptane? That wouldn't be, if you wouldn't be wrong, but you want to keep your parent molecule be your longest continuous carbon chain, which is five in this case. Once it gets up to Once it gets the larger. So if I had... Um, let's say I had this molecule. Our longest continuous carbon chain is five. So it's going to be pentane that has a cyclopropyl group attached to it. So, but, so cyclo can also be applied to a branch. If your branch is a cycle, you can you just say cyclo whatever. But just it has like, to be the lower number. Has to be the lower number. Yeah. Or as a way to avoid more complicated branches. Um, but we'll get to that in a minute. So we would say this is two cyclopropyl pentane. This may steer us off track, but what about if the cyclo? The sibling structures are connected, not just by. That's a separate. If the if two sides of the cyclo structure are fused, that's a separate naming system that we're not going to get to, like naphthalene. Yeah. Yeah. So we that has its own nomenclature. That if you ever went into the field where that winds up being important, you learn that nomenclature. But it's beyond what we what we teach in first year gen or first year OCAM. So if we have, here's some, some examples. There's your egg-shaped <laughs> cycloheptane, right? And the way you count the sides is it looks like it's, you know, not a hexagon, not an octagon.
So how would we name that? I guess, yeah, let me, let me make the point real quick. Do we need a locant here? Do we need to specify where the ethyl group is? Because it should be you. <laughs> Wherever we put the ethyl group, it's just going to be carbon to one. We only have one thing attached to a ring structure. Wherever it's attached is carbon one to the ring structure. So, like, if you have more than one thing attached to the ring structure, now we do need to specify. Like this one, top left. Our so ring where structure. Would you start, where would you start counting in the ring structure to, like... To keep the numbers as low as possible. Just like we okay. pick which end to start at to keep the numbers as low as possible with our ring structure, we can pick any of these as carbon one, and then we can start counting either way around the ring structure. So if this, we make that carbon one, we can say that's carbon two or that's carbon two, right? And which, so we'll which way is convenient. Yeah, okay. And to split more hairs. And to split more hairs, <laughs> exactly. I will where we start at the biggest. And we want the, the halogens to be carbon one. It's going to be one, three, either way, if we count the right direction. But if we can get both of the halogens to have a one, that's more ideal. So one yeah. fluoro, one fluoro, three propyl cycloheptane. How would you identify, like, I don't know, I'm going to say stereo chemistry. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> you are some S's. Oh, well, that's right. Okay. All right. So, how about here? It's going to be cyclo hexane. Everything outside the cyclohexane group is a branch we have to name. So it's going to be dimethyl. And we're going to want to specify where both of them are, but we can, don't worry about the numbering yet. Just leave space for it. And then we've got an ethyl group, right? So we need to specify where all three of those are relative to each other. Can we start with one of the methyl groups of these one? Yeah, to make the most sense, right? If we started and we're out of oh, well, we could do the middle or the except you have to count the same direction. Oh, you have to pick a direction, direction. Yeah. it has to be the same. You could start with the ethyl because you just if you started with your ethyl, then your ethyl is one, you get one here and then three and four, right? If you start here, you get one, two, and four. Okay, so the, the the size of the of the branch doesn't really make a difference with priority. Gotcha. So keep all of the numbers as low as possible. All added up together. So, or because we could also do all added up together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because you could also say one, two, five. That's five. Yeah. We don't want that though. Okay. We don't want one, three, four because that's yeah, adds that's up to eight. eight. So the best way to do it would be one, two, four. Seven. This adds up to seven, so this is the best way to number it. So four ethyl, one, two, dimethyl. There's a lot of freedom with deciding what carbon one is, it seems like, but there's almost always one best way to do it. And the best way is whatever keeps your numbers as low as possible especially on the halogens or whatever other functional groups we add down the line, keep the most complicated branch with the lowest number is usually the, the way to think about it. What about propyl cyclopentane? Is there anything tricky about that one? Start with your cyclopentane. So start with the pentagon. Doesn't have to be perfect, just needs five sides. 
and then pick a spot, any of them, or let's say we only have one branch on it, so all the carbons are identical to each other. So one, two, three. One, one, three, trichlorocyclohexane. Start with your cyclohexane. And it, again, all of these right now, they're all identical to each other. All the carbons are, are identical. So it doesn't really matter which one we count as carbon one. So pick one that's convenient. I'm not gonna make that carbon one because I don't wanna run into the buttons over here for the edge of the paper or anything. So I'm gonna make this carbon one just purely based on the space I have available, just because it's convenient for me. If I was making this a figure to put into a lab write-up or into a lab procedure, I might pick it so that, um, pick the carbon that allows me to not take up as much vertical space on the paper, right? So They're all identical. Where you want to, yeah, place them. as long as, the number, the number oh, can't right. consistent. Exactly. Yeah. I could put the third chlorine here or there. Up there. I just have to pick one. Again, I don't want to use that space because I know those buttons get touchy on this whiteboard, right? What about this one? Let's name this molecule and then we'll draw a molecule. Go from the bottom up on this thing. What's your longest continuous carbon chain? Also, it's also five. So we could make this our parent molecule, and then we have one really complicated branch. It's going to be like parentheses within parentheses. Or you could just have, or finish that, the alkene branch. Make that our parent molecule. molecule. And then have the cyclopentane. Exactly. And, and the rest of it. And the rest of it, yeah. So we just call it pentane. And then our pentane is going to have three branches, two methyl, and really I probably should switch those two. Make give the chlorine the lowest number. Right. Four methyl, two chloro. Three cyclopentyl pentane. Okay. This is alkane nomenclature and nomenclature in, in organic chemistry in general is an exercise in none of it's that complicated on its own. No one part of this is complicated on its own. But put it all together and you get something that is a mouthful and takes up two lines on a sheet of binder paper. Um, but that's fine. You just take it one step at a time. You get a big complicated structure like this. It's the, if you've ever heard the old, um, the old adage, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. <laughs> Doesn't matter how big the molecule is. Find your longest continuous carbon chain and just start adding prefixes. Go in the other direction. We had one, one, one dichloro, two methyl propane. Start with the propane. Boom. Two methyl propane. Boom. One one dichloro. Mm -hmm. 
methyl propane, all of those, those N carbons are all the same. So I could have put the chlorines on any of them. And, and I do this in, in black and white when I'm writing these, because when I'm, when I'm gonna print your tests, they're gonna be in black and white. Um, but a lot of times, it, um, a lot of like things like Molview will color code them as well. Certain atoms are always the same, the oxygen are always red, for red. Uh, and typically nitrogen is blue. Chlorine is usually green because chlorine gas is green. And sulfur is usually yellow. Sulfur is usually yellow, things like that. It doesn't really matter. That's just, you know, that's just window dressing. It makes it, makes it look prettier. Um, especially if you're doing a 3D, if you're doing a 3D structure, it matters. If you're doing the ball and stick model, it matters because it's a I mean, you're kind of hard. trying to show what's different from exactly from the carbons, right? Make carbons black, hydrogens white, etc. Let's do some more practice with the with the branches. We've got five minutes. We'll do a couple of these. And then there'll be a couple of these on the, the quiz this weekend. So you can one, two, three, <laughs> four, five, six, seven, four. Oh, there's one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. That's that brute course technique I was talking to you about earlier. That's the easiest way to make you do a print. It's <laughs> the same molecule that's on the exam, on the, on the quiz, isn't it? It's it might be. It's oh, the I same think mistake that I made. That's all the same. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> exactly. So don't don't think in your in your don't be shackled by your your um, you English speaking. Name? Right from left to right, count you know, from left to right. I even went from right to left, but it still didn't work that way. Still, yeah. <laughs> even Japanese. Right. You got to think in three dimensions. You can't yeah. think you can't linearly. Think linearly uh... <laughs> All right. So that's an octane. Uh, and we'll be able it's to just a single branch, 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 but it's a complex branch. So you could, this is our, our special it's case where I'll allow you to say isopropyl. But you could also just say four methyl methyl. And you would still have to put the four on it. If it's isopropyl, it would say It'd just four be four isopropyl. isopropyl. Right. Um, four methyl ethyl. I think it had some six. I think it has some other one. I counted six. I said hexane. Slightly off. But there was a big problem. There was no statement. I know there was no statement. There was, I got that. <laughs> Same thing here. I'm going to force you to use parentheses by just making one of them really long. You have to make <laughs> that your parent molecule. If that's your parent molecule, your branch has to have a branch. So nine, three, four, five, six, eight, nine. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So no, yeah, correct. It's no name. Yeah, I don't know. Propyl that also has a methyl. And it's got a propyl group attached to the no name. And it's going to be on carbon. It will be on five. five, yeah. But your propyl group has a methyl. And because there are two places we could attach it, we have to specify that that's in one the parentheses, yeah. one methylpropyl. The, the, where the parentheses are really nice is, is just like with map, you can kind of just treat this as one block. Everything inside the parentheses is one object, and it doesn't really so the one rest of the whole, name. It's one whole part of the branch. Exactly. And then you can once you're when you're inside the parentheses, you then can ignore everything go outside. Yeah. So it, it does allow it's a really clean and pretty elegant 
way to give you a ton of flexibility for naming these branches. You could just as easily start from the parentheses and work your way out. Right, and you could, you could even have a complicated branch that's got a chlorine on a method. Right, yeah. Like you still, it wouldn't change any of your rules, right? If this was, um, if that was a chlorine, that's still octane, that's still a complicated branch. It's just, it's gonna be, instead of being a methyl ethyl, it's chloroethyl, right? So those prefixes apply to everything, which is handy. And going back a couple now, we had this one where we had a methyl that had a fluorine attached to it. And I said, well, why don't we just, you can count it like that. You just have to get, you have a fluoromethyl group in parentheses then instead of having a methyl group and a fluoro group separately. But our rules allow that. But you're still gonna draw the exact same molecule Exactly. That's the whole point of that little unambiguous aspect. That's exactly what I mean. All right, go the other direction. How about, let's do the bottom one. Isobutyl one. That's what we would name as isobutyl if we were using the old way of naming them. Just in case we're running the Yeah, we'd like to run the back and forth. So, and again, maybe this is my, this is definitely my bias, but maybe, and probably shared by other people, I find it way easier to decipher this and get to the structure because it's way easier to forget rules when you start from the structure and have to go to the name, at least for me. This is definitely a case where in test taking strategy, I'm gonna give you a section on the midterm where it's like this and a section that's like this. Use these to remind yourself of the rules you might've forgotten on the first part. Yeah. Like if you see, I put something with parentheses down below and you didn't write anything in parentheses like, up hey, above, you're like, oh, wait. Maybe I'm not check if there's a complicated branch. Right, did I miss something? I mean, don't slow yourself down too much with that, but if you forget how to do it, then you can kind of work, you can you reverse have some right here. Yeah. And that applies to standardized tests too. That, like, there's almost always a way you can use the test against itself to, to jog your memory or remember how to do something. Um, that's real math being done, not just arithmetic. <laughs> right. All right, last one. Guys, we're, we're out of time. We'll leave that one for now. We'll start with, with that or something similar on, uh, on Tuesday. So there'll be some practice naming things, probably both directions. I'll, I will look at those problems and change them up a little bit for you okay. two that took it last week, yeah. um, just for more practice. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and there'll be we'll an acid base one on there too. Yeah, I might change the numbers a little bit, but on the other hand, that should make way more sense to you now. So, <laughs> yeah, so we were not confused with that. Answers for like, yeah, I think that was the right, and then you said it was the left. So I'll leave that one so that you can figure it out.